I'm very grateful, firstly, Bichwat Rav. I'm very great, grateful to the Rav for giving up his time again to answer our questions. Um, the questions that we're going to deal with this evening were submitted for a previous Q&A, but we didn't um, manage to cover them all on that occasion. Um, and for that reason, it's a kind of a sorted array of topics. Um, if everyone could just remain, please, on mute, uh, unless I ask you otherwise. Um, the first question is anonymous. Um, is there an obligation to test clothing for shatness when wool and linen are not mentioned together on the garment label? In some cases, the answer is definitely yes. It depends on the type of garment. If this is the type of garment that frequently contains shatnis, even though this is not listed anywhere on the label because it is not the major or even minor type of material of that garment, such as a jacket, but it is sometimes, not infrequently, uh, linen is used um, in, in the various parts of the jacket and the shoulder and the, and the collar, in, in trousers and the uh, waistband, etc. It would not be listed as being the material from which the garment is made, because it's truthfully not the material from which the garment is made, but it is nevertheless there and it is sewn together with the wool. So the kinds of garments that frequently contain shatnes, one does have to check. If it is the kind of garment, on the other hand, that essentially there's, there's no reason to suspect shatnes, then one does not have to check. Thank you. Um, I, I've I've heard in the past, Harav, that um, uh, people have said people have said that uh, only very expensive designer suits have this hashash of uh, of 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 having linen in them. Um, would 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 the Rav disagree with that, or is is should should one really check anything? Any, any suits? I, I I do not claim to be a hands-on expert in, in this. In this field. In other words, I don't spend my, my days opening up garments and checking them. People who do this all the time for a living uh, obviously would know much more how frequent it is, what kind of garment. But I, I have heard from people in the know that it does come up more frequently than people might imagine. Uh, in, in very Usually in things like overcoats, um, suit jackets, um, th those, are the, those are the usual culprits, so to speak. Uh, so if it, if it is something along those lines, I would say yes, one should check it. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is uh, also anonymous. Uh, are e-cigarettes kosher? This is a very good question. I'm glad this question was asked. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to state categorically if a particular e-cigarette type uh, product is kosher or not. Um, this has to do with <clears throat> the various substances that that are used in in these in these devices. Uh, Particular, particularly the gl glycerine, I think it's called, um, which can be made from can be from from vegetable uh, of vegetable origin, but it can also be of animal origin, and it is very difficult to discover, to discover, mainly because the companies, so I understand, having read about this a little bit. Uh, the companies who manuf manufacture these things are not very forthcoming uh, about, about the source of, of, of these substances. But we do know that some of these substances definitely can be of animal origin. Now, th there's also the question of the, f the flavorings and what have you. Uh, it's very difficult to know. There may be one or two e-cigarettes with, with a hersher. I would say that a hersher is, is most definitely required. Um, but truthfully, the uh, um, 
the real the real problem is not 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 the the very real kashrut question of, of the glycerin and and other substances in in the uh, what's called the uh, e juice or the uh, liquid which which is then turned into a vapor which is then inhaled those those are problems in and of themselves without a doubt that that is sufficient reason to say that one must have a echshel because if the glycerin can be from uh, animal fat which it can be uh, and other substances in these in these uh, products can also be of uh, various uh, non-kosher sources that, that itself of course is a very real problem and and because the vapor is designed to be inhaled the fact that it is not edible in its non inhalable form that, that is to say when it, it is not uh, in the form of an aerosol or a vapor the fact that it is not edible in that form is not relevant really because it is not designed to be ingested in that form it is designed to be turned into a vapor into an aerosol and then inhaled and then one does taste the the uh, the various substances that are that are in this product that's and the, the proof of that is that there are tens or hundreds or even thousands of flavors that you can purchase these uh, that these things come in so obviously you, you do taste something and and therefore the fact that you do taste a, a pleasurable flavor when you inhale it uh, and if it is in fact from a non-kosher source that is a, a very real problem it's, it's likely to be a sore if it can be, maybe maybe in a Torah in many instances if it is from such sources but the real problem with these uh, with these products, in my view, is the fact that they are, it is, shall we say, it is impossible to claim that they are safe. Many, uh, many claim that they are not safe, that they are dangerous. Uh, in, in, in the form in which they come, when they are not heated up, the various, the liquid which is inside the this product or inside the, the pod or the cartridge, whatever it's called, before it's heated up, it might be considered safe at room temperature. But once it is heated up, you have within these device, within these products, you have formaldehyde, arsenic, benzene, chromium, mag, mag, manganese, nickel, zinc, lead, etc., etc. There are all kinds of things there. I don't think anyone can really claim these things have been thoroughly investigated. They are being investigated and, and tested as we speak. It will probably it will probably be many years, probably more likely decades, until we can say something definitive about the the uh, the health aspects and the possible dangers involved in using these products. And anything which is which is which is uh, dangerous or possibly dangerous where it is reasonable to assume that it is dangerous uh, is a sur. Uh, this is uh, as the Ramah writes in Yura De'a Siman Ko, uh, Kof Petzain based on the Gemara in Holim Daf Yod uh, anything that is that that causes danger is to be treated even more as a more serious isur than something which is a sur mitzad Mitzad, mitzad isur Torah, as the Gemara as the states, Sakanta Hamira Mi Isura. So there is the, the, the fact that these things are very possibly harmful to one's health. And it's not something that's necessary. One cannot claim it's something that, you know, Dashu Borabim, it's not something that it's a normal part of, of existence and life that uh, we, we, we engage in various activities which may involve a certain unavoidable but normal day-to-day -day type of risk, such as crossing the street, for example. It's not that kind of thing. One doesn't have to use these products. On top of all of this, uh, it's quite clear that these things, uh, which are designed to deliver high doses of nicotine to the person using them, that is, that is, in fact, why these things were invented in the first place. They were originally invented 
to aid people who were already smoking tobacco to try and wean themselves off tobacco because of all the uh, other substances which one ingests or inhales when one smokes a cigarette, tar and, and other, other substances, as opposed to just the nicotine. And nicotine and other substances in these products are addictive. And in general, anything that is plainly addictive and that is not not necessary, not required, not, not uh, beneficial, but simply a, an unfortunate and debilitating uh, habit it is most definitely to be avoided. Thank you, Harav. Um, we, the next question, I mean, this is this, a, a lot to say on this, but uh, in the time that we have, uh, what is the Rav's opinion on abortion? Yes, as you say, in, in the time available, <laughs> because we could spend uh, months and years discussing this sugya. It is actually a, a fascinating and very profound sugya. We obviously will not do that. Let me begin by uh, stating that, as is well known, this is a mahluketha posikim. Maybe that's not surprising to many, but uh, it's actually a very real uh, Mahloket. It's a very serious mahloket. Because on the one hand, we have some posikim. For example, Rabbeinu um, Moshe Feinstein, for example, who uh, is of the opinion that it is mamash considered shefichuth damim. And it is only in a case where, where the Gemara discusses these things, where a woman's life uh, is in danger that the the uh, fetus endangers the life of the mother. Uh, only there is a mutar to end the life of the fetus. For example, by by uh, aborting it, by cutting it up and removing it from the mother, because uh, without this, the mother's life uh, is is most definitely uh, at risk. Uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein has a very long teshuva on this. And his view is, is quite emphatic, that it is uh, considered shifichut dami. Yes, it is true that the Talmud Bavli in uh, Sanhedrin Daf Unzain uh, states that uh, a goy, a non-Jew, who kills a, a fetus is hayav mitha, as if he killed uh, a, a person who has already been born, as opposed to a Jew who is not uh, liable for the death penalty for so doing. But we also have the, the well-known rule uh, in Sanhedrin, Daf Nuntet, as I recall, that that which is Asur for a ben is also plainly Asur for, for Israel. There may be a difference in the punishment, in the precise legal ramifications of doing a certain act. But the fact that it is Asur uh, cannot be doubted. And no one, no one believes for a moment that there's no Esau involved in, in uh, killing a, a fetus. However, we do have, uh, we do have the Mishnah. I'll read the Mishnah to you briefly. The woman who was found guilty of a capital crime. And she is now about to be executed. We do not wait for, for her to give birth. In other words, if a woman has been found uh, liable of, and guilty and she now is about to be executed by the Beth Din, um, and, but she is pregnant, so what do we do? Do we wait for her to give birth because there's another living human being in her, inside her or not? So the halacha is that we don't wait. This is a Mishnah Mephoresh at Musech Arachim. Rambam brings this at the end of Perek Yod Beth in the Chol Sanhedrin. I'll read the, 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 the Lashon to you. Misha Nirmar Dino En Mashin Otho. A person has been found guilty and is, is uh, now to be executed. We do not delay. Ela Yeharech Biyomo. He is killed on the same day. If he has been found guilty, 
there's no such thing as goes on in some places, particularly in the United States, where people can be on death row for year, years upon years. It, it is done immediately. If, even if a woman was pregnant, we do not wait for her to give birth. Now, the, uh, the Abbas learns from this Mishnah, from this Salacha, that clearly, therefore, there's not Shafiqud Damim. If it was Shafiqud Damim in the usual sense, then this wouldn't be the case. We would have to wait. That would come, that would uh, trump any, any consideration of, of not being Mashheh the Din, not, not uh, prolonging the agony of the, of the person who is of the condemned woman. That would have to take precedence, but that's not the case. So, the correct understanding of the status of of a, an unborn human being is basically that the unborn child has a an intermediate status between a non non living person altogether, a person who's dead, shall we say, or a, or a non-existent human being, an imaginary human being, and a person who is who is real and alive and before us. We know that the, the halakha is that uh, as long as the child has not been born, and the definition of that is that until the head or most of the body, even if it came out in the reverse way, uh, until the head or most of its body emerges from the mother, up until that point, uh, it may be killed in order to save, to save the life of the mother. But the moment that, that, that the head, for example, is, is out, is considered a separate human being, and you do not kill one human being in order to save another human being. That is, that this is a Mishnah in Masechet Ahiloth or Ohaloth, Perek Zayn. So the true status of an unborn child is a very difficult to define intermediate reality. There are there are posikim such as Agaon Rav Waldenberg about Tzitzeli Ezer, who takes a somewhat more lenient position than Rav Feinstein regarding uh, abortion, and therefore in in certain cases such as uh, a very real or, or definite definite knowledge or very real uh, suspicion that the child will suffer from some very serious congenital diseases, etc. Uh, in such cases, it is mutar. So, so writes Balsit uh, Sariyeza. There are also those who said that uh, it is a sort of, to kill such a, uh, an unborn child because of the sort of hashhata, bal tashhid, and because of the fact that this is going to be a human being with Zohar So, the long and the short of it is, it's a very involved question. It has everything to do with the specifics of, of a particular case. And therefore, every such case needs to be, first of all, discussed with very serious doctors. But I stress, with serious doctors who are Yiresh Shamayim, who, who really understand the, the humra, the severity, the the seriousness of discussing such things, which is the name of Hashot. Stammer doctor, I'm afraid to say, cannot be trusted when it comes to such things, just as many doctors cannot be trusted with regards to many things, uh, certainly not with regards to a question such as this. It has to be a, a doctor who understands, who knows something about the Torah, who lives according to the Torah, who we have a very good reason to believe is Yeresh Shamayim, and understands the, the seriousness of the matter at hand. And even then, one opinion as to the state of the fetus is not sufficient. We have to get a second and even third opinion to be certain. There have been cases here in Israel in hospitals that a woman was told, a woman who, who had not been able to have a child for many, many years. And, and at some point they, they did an ultrasound or whatever, and they were convinced that the, the, the fetus had died. Of course, this is a great tragedy for this family because they've been trying for so many years to have a child. And she was about to, it was about to be removed. And then another doctor came along and said he knew the case and he was aware of the, 
the particular circumstances. And he said, let, let me check again and, and look again and let's make sure that this is in fact the case. Well, the long, uh, to make a long story short, that dead fetus is a, uh, a live, perfectly healthy uh, and successful woman today. There are such cases. In other words, you have to be certain first of the medical facts, absolutely certain. Then you have to speak to a real Tamid HaChamim who is familiar with this Sulbiya and all the ins and outs of it. Only in such circumstances can an abortion be considered. Yes, there are circumstances when an abortion can be allowed, but it is not something to be done lightly, and it has to be uh, discussed with the kinds of uh, people, doctors, and Tamadei HaChamim that I mentioned. The, the notion of abortion uh, for convenience or as an alternative form of contraception is a repulsive idea uh, and something that uh, should not really require uh, much explanation. Thank you, Aram. Um, so that the next question is uh, also anonymous. Uh, the anonymous person says, I like the pain. I, I, I want to mention one other thing. Yes. The, the Talmud Bavli in the Sefer of Hamoth of Samach Taif Amud Beth states that if a woman had uh, aborted a fetus naturally um, for the 40th day of the pregnancy, in the, the words of the Talmud, I will quote this to you. Um, <clears throat> The Lashon of the Talmud is Ad Arba'im Maya Ba'alamahi. It's not, it's not yet considered really a fetus. But it's just considered like water. In other words, till the 40th day, the, the various organs and limbs have not really begun to form. And, and therefore, for example, if a woman was pregnant but aborted the full 40 days from the beginning of the pregnancy, and then she has a child after that, that child is considered a Bukhor. Okay, and uh, when it comes to, to eating turuma, such such a, a herayon is not considered a herayon. It's considered something which, which is not yet uh, a valid fetus, shall we say? So that that is also a consideration. But again, this is all in cases where there is a tzorech gadol ma'od. Either no question, if if the woman's life is in danger, then there's no question that it is mutar. If if it's really clear that the woman's life is is in danger. But even if it's a question of, of uh, various diseases or conditions, which are also very problematic, both not for the child, not only the child that might be born, but also for the family, uh, then yes, it is possible in some, certain circumstances, but it has to be uh, considered uh, and when the right people have to be, have to be uh, consulted. Thank you. Um, the next question is anonymous. He says, I like to paint and draw as a hobby. Are there things that I am forbidden from painting or drawing? The only things that occur to me that would be a sword to paint or to draw would be things connected to Abu Dhazara. Um, so painting, a, a, a painting of, of a church, for example. Or, or anything to do with Abu Dazara, I think is plainly a sword. Now we all we all know that in the world of art, in the uh, in the Western world, certainly over the last couple of centuries, the idea of drawing nude human beings, particularly women, is somehow normal, accepted, and uh, even desirable. But that doesn't mean that we we accept such ideas. There's no reason why. Um, why a, a person gifted with this talent from Hashem should, should use it to, to paint a, a naked woman. What exactly is the purpose, the aim with such a thing? Uh, if a woman wants to paint a, a painting of a, of a naked woman for her own viewing alone or for the viewing of women only for whatever reason, I'm not sure I would know why, but let, let us say that is the case. 
And I suppose there's no ESO in that. But for a man to draw such a thing, paint such a, uh, an image, I do not see why that would be mutar. And uh, for my sins, I also do not see why it is necessary or desirable. Thank you. Um, Harav, what about the sun or the moon and things like that? Well, once upon a time, when uh, it was very common for people to worship such objects, uh, a case could have been made, even though the real Esau pertains to a three-dimensional object, like a sculpture. But one could make the claim that uh, it would be a sur or undesirable, at least. Today, we do not live amongst people who, who worship the sun and the moon, as far as I know. And, uh, and therefore, it's like other types of Abu Dazara when, when we say that, you know, Avad Shemo, in terms of Abu Dazara, is no longer considered um, something to do with Abu Dazara. The same was also true, shall we say, of various pieces of music uh, written by Johann Sebastian Bach. We all know that much of his music was. Not all of it, but much of his music was written uh, with the aim of being uh, part of, of worship in the church. Uh, and that, that, at that time, that was the, that was the case. But uh, since these pieces of music have become like any other piece of classical music that, has, that is not specifically connected to Abu Dazara at all, and, and his original intention or the fact that it was originally played in that setting is no longer relevant because now this piece of music is not related, not connected, not associated with Abu Dazara. So it is mutar to hear such music, for example. The same would apply to painting an image of the moon or something. On a related issue, what about owning 3D figurines, gnomes, that type of thing that have no connection to Abu Dazara? According to the a simple uh, reading of the halakha, one could one might suggest that it's a sur. However, again, I think that it's, uh, it should be viewed in the historical context in as much as once upon a time, statues, statuettes, various graven images of all kinds were, were ubiquitous and uh, almost always associated with Abu Dazara. So it's obvious why Hazal was so opposed to them and required them to be destroyed or disfigured, etc. Uh, again, nowadays we don't really have such people who who uh, do this sort of thing. Uh, certainly not with it when it comes to a, a garden gnome or something like that. No one would associate that with with Abu Dazara. Again, that that practice, that reality, is basically gone from the world, at least most most of parts of the world in which which we inhabit. And, uh, and therefore, I think uh, it is Mukta. Thank you. Um, next question is also anonymous. Um, it's a bit of a long question, so I'm just going to summarize it as um, should one be called, I assume this is for the, to the Torah, by the name of a father who is a heretic? Yes, I, I read the question, and we're talking here about a person as described by the anonymous uh, person from whom this question comes. That the biological father of of a, a girl, and the person sending the question is the stepfather, apparently. Uh, the biological father uh, denies his Jewish identity, is intermarried in the Catholic Church, and actively works to undermine the Jewish identity of his daughter, etc., etc. This being the case, I think it is very correct to uh, call this girl by her, her mother's name, or alternately by the by the name of her stepfather. Another possibility might be, you know, Ben Avraham, like Avraham Avinu, or something like that. Thank you. Um, now that I've read the full question, I realize it couldn't possibly be being called to the Torah. Um, the next question is uh, from uh, Benjamin Lenkin. Uh, if a person expresses thoughts on Facebook, which are clearly opposed to Torah ideology, May one speak against such a person? Does his posting on Facebook constitute something which is already in the public realm, or would speaking about this person's statements be considered Loshan Hara? In the same vein, what about those who say things on Facebook which constitute violations of halakha? All right, well, let's 
deal with this on two levels. First of all, who decides what Torah ideology is or what, what constitutes a violation of halakha? One might legitimately ask this question. And it's a real question because in the view of some person, rightly or wrongly, a particular view or a particular ideology might be opposed to what they understand the Torah to be about. Maybe they don't understand what the Torah is about, but that, that they believe it to be opposed to the Torah. And then they might uh, begin spreading Lashon Hara or attacking this person in public uh, because they think that they are doing a great miswa by so doing. And perhaps it's not, that's not the case at all. Perhaps it's quite the opposite. Perhaps their, oh, their ideology is, is the one that is opposed to the Torah. And the person who they are attacking is actually expressing a, a Torah position, which, however, to them, uh, is not, not seen as such. So one has to be absolutely certain that we're talking about something which is clearly opposed to the Torah without question. If one is not sure, then one should find out. One should ask a competent Tamid HaChamim, is this something which is clearly opposed to the Torah or, or are there real Tamid HaChamim who hold this view, even though I'm very opposed to that view? And the same holds true for that which or does not constitute uh, a violation of halakha. According to some, certain things might be a violation of halakha, and according to others, it might not be. And it may in fact be a mahaloket, like certain things we've mentioned in this, in this evening's uh, questions. So one has to be certain of what we're discussing. But assuming that that is clear, that we're discussing positions which which uh, are plainly opposed to the, to the Torah and to Halakha, then it is mutar to, to oppose and to lambast even such opinions and such people. And clearly something which has been posted on Facebook is uh, at least equivalent to that which is mentioned in the Temura about something which has been said in front of three people. Uh, and, and therefore it's no longer considered Lashon Hara to relate it because it's, it's generally known by now. Certainly that's the case with Facebook. So it's not considered Lashon Hara any, any longer. And it is Nechshav Davel Shenema Bifne Shalosha. And if you, if you want an example of, of such a thing, well, people who, who uh, spread various types of uh, ideologies, which, which are plainly, even though they might themselves be Orthodox Jews nominally in many aspects of their lives, but it is also the case that some Jews, some Orthodox Jews even, unfortunately, are so influenced and bamboozled and, and misguided by various opinions and ideologies that are broadly uh, considered nowadays, unfortunately, in the very, very sick world in which we live, to be normal or acceptable or, or, uh, or even progressive, uh, such, such views, no matter how, how many Orthodox Jews there might be, or, or nominally Orthodox Jews there might be who subscribe to those views, if they are plainly opposed to authentic Torah thought and practice, well, that that is the fact, they are opposed to the Torah and, and, and the fact that some people nevertheless um, hold those opinions does not change that fact. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin, did you have anything to clarify, to be clarified there? No, thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you very much, Arav. Um, the next question, also a bit of a long question, so I'm going to summarize it for the benefit of the audience as uh, what are the guidelines for traveling from, Is from Israel to Hull on Yom Tov Sheni? All right, so let us begin by explaining that this question is, is being asked by, and I've, it's interesting, I've been asked this question by more than one person over the last couple of months. This is being asked by someone who lives in Chutz Laretz, where there are two days of Yom Tov, but they will be in Eretz Yisrael for Yom Tov, where, in my view, based on the uh, Hacham Tzvi and uh, Rabbi David Friedman Mikarlin and other opinions, a, a Jew coming to Eretz Yisrael, spending the Chag in Eretz Yisrael, is only required to keep here one day of Yom Tov, not two days. In fact, it is wrong 
for him to keep a second day on Tov when here in Israel. It is true there is another opinion. There are many Pusagim who hold otherwise, that a person who resides in Chutz Laaretz must keep two days of Yom Tov in, when in Eretz Yisrael. But as I said, there, are, there is another opinion, and I believe that opinion is, is uh, most definitely correct. That was also, by the way, the, the, the Psak of Rabbi Neil Shalim, such as Agon Rabbi Shmuel Misalant, uh, 150 and more years ago. So such a person who wishes to return to Chutz Laaretz after Yom Tov is, has ended in Eretz Yisrael, wants to get on a plane in Eretz Yisrael when there's no longer Yom Tov here, but will be flying and also perhaps landing in Chutz Laaretz when it is Yom Tov Sheni over there. That's the question. Is it Utah to do so? Based on what the uh, Baal Ma'or writes, as long as a person has not arrived in a place where there is a, a Jewish settlement, where, where Torah Jews reside and keep second day Yom Tov, and this would apply, I imagine, to most airports. You don't usually have uh, Torah Jews in airports on second day Yom Tov in Chutz Laaretz. And airports are also not, part, not generally considered part of the, of the city. They're, they're usually separate uh, by way more than a Tom Shabbat. So I think it is perfectly possible to, to uh, claim, and I have actually seen certain Rabbanim write this, that if one lands in the airport in Chutz it's on second day on Tov, one may, rem one may do so and remain in that airport till the end of Yom Tov, and then, and then travel home. But one cannot travel from there to a place, to a town, a city, a suburb, where there are Torah Jews residing and keeping a second day Yom Tov. That's, that's basically, that's the question, and that's basically the answer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is also from uh, from Chaim Ginsberg, uh, who asked that previous question. Uh, in the Rav's view, what is the ideal time to light Neroth Shel Yom Tov? I think the ideal time is Nifna Shikiah before sunset, as with uh, Neroth Shabbat. Unless, of course, we're talking about two days of Yom Tov in Chutz Laaretz, uh, in which uh, or, or rather, well, according to those who, which is most people, as we all know, who hold that, that there are two days of Rosh Hashanah and Eretz Yisrael as well, then you do not, you cannot light the candles for the second day before the first day is over. In in Chutz Laaretz, if if the uh, let's say the first day is Shabbat and, and 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 the second day is Yom Tov, then obviously you cannot light the candles on Shabbat. You have to wait till Shabbat is out. But if we're talking about a regular Yom Tov. I think the ideal time is to light before the Shkia, before the sunset. Thank you. Um, we now have a question from Naomi. Uh, can I take the water collected in a receptacle from Natilath Yadayim upon arising and pour it out onto potted plants outside to water them? According to the chat of the Talmud Bavli, Masechet Shabbat, uh, the answer would be no. You cannot do so, because according to what the Talmud states there, there is Rah Ra'a, Shura al Hamayim. There is a, a kind of Tum'ah attached to this water, and it is to be gotten rid of in, in such a manner that it, so to speak, disappears and not uh, remain in, in, in any place or in any vessel um, in our home or next to our home. Is this, in fact, the halakha? Um, I would say that it is not a halakha. The Rambam clearly does not think it's a halakha because the Rambam doesn't bring such a, such a statement. Uh, what, I, what one sees from the Perush of Rabbeinu Tarahya, who was a Tamil of the Rambam in Mithraim in Egypt, on the Sechet Shabbat, when he discusses this Sufya, uh, the understanding of, of some of the Vishwanim not certainly not all of them, because many of them certainly thought, like Rashi and the Tosafot, they were talking about Rahra'a, talking about some kind of Tum'ah involved with the water uh, for washing one's hands in the morning. But 
according to Rabbeinu Prahya and others, I'm sure the Rambam held this view also, the, the uh, concern uh, of, uh, for not uh, touching one's uh, eyes or, or placing one's fingers in one's mouth, shall we say, in the morning before washing up to eyes, was for reasons of hygiene and health. In other words, the simple assumption that the hands might be dirty for various reasons, and uh, and in fact, it's it's uh, it's a, it's a fact. If you are constantly touching your eye, not just when you wake up in the middle of the day, also if you constantly uh, scratch or rub your eyes with hands that have not been thoroughly washed recently, you may end up causing yourself some kind of infection in the eye or some kind of redness or uh, discomfort in the eye. We all know this. So that, that's what Rabbeinu Prahya says over there in that sugya. But uh, according to the more standard understanding, this, this it was Yasu because of the Ruach Ra'a. With, with, with regards to placing such water into a potted plant, you would think it couldn't possibly have any negative impact on the health of the plant, which I'm sure it would not. So according to the standard practice, the answer would be it's Asur, but uh, I personally would not, I would not claim it to be Asur. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have Naomi on the line to, with any, to, to, to ask any follow-up questions. So we're going to move on to the next one, which is from Gidon. Uh, what, is the oblig what, what is the obligation to wash hands after entering a cemetery? What is, what is the idea of washing the serogin? And is holding sisif in the cemetery a custom, hiding, sorry, sisif in the, in the cemetery, a custom or obligation? Very well. Washing hands after being in a cemetery or at a funeral is not mentioned in the in the Talmud. Is not mentioned in the Rambam. It is a it is a minhag. It is an ancient minhag. It's discussed already by the Ramban. Uh, it's discussed by uh, the Mordechai, other Rishonim. Various Rishonim give di different reasons for this uh, for this practice. Uh, one reason given by some, uh, some of the Rishonim name has to do again with the uh, Tum'ah or Ruach Ra'ah that exists when uh, in a cemetery or near, near the dead. And washing one's hands is, is a, a way of, of removing that Tum'ah or that Ruach Ra'ah from, from one's person. Others say it has to do with, uh, the Ramban suggests that, that it has to do with uh, it's like a, water is a, like maim hayim, the concept maim hayim. Water has to do with life. So when we leave a, a place of death, you wish to, to do something which suggests life or, and being different and separate from this reality of death with, with, with which we have now just been in contact. Uh, so th th there are various reasons. It's, it, it, it is, um, I mean, how clearly it's brought in the Shulchan Aruch and Siman Dalet, at the beginning of the Shulchan Aruch and Arhaim. Uh, it's a generally accepted custom. I don't actually think it's a hova mitzat hadin. I don't think it's an obligation. Um, but of course, it can't hurt. Okay. And, as for whether, and as for whether it's three times in Basel Rurin, well, again, it has to do with the time, with the reason. And they're also Rishonim, by the way, like the Meiri, um, who, who suggests that it's really for just for reasons of Nikiyuth, similar to what I said before about Rabbeinu Prahya with the washing hands in the morning uh, when one rises. So if it's for reasons of nikiyuf, of, of hygiene and, and making sure one's hands are clean, uh, then it really makes no difference how many times you wash them and, and in what order, whether it's or not the whether it's alternate hands or not. According to those who see it as similar to the kind of tum'ah, impurity or, or some negative spiritual reality, which which uh, surrounds the person who was, is in a, was in a cemetery or in the presence of, of the dead. Uh, and they compare it to what we find in, uh, what is found in the Zohar, talking about uh, washing hands in a certain way upon rising, etc. So they compare it to that, and therefore they talk about three times in, in the Serupin, doing it alternately in different hands. Uh, again, I don't consider these things to be halakha, 
The Rambam does not discuss any of these things, neither the washing the hands in the morning in that fashion, nor when leaving a cemetery, neither does the reef, neither does the rosh. So uh, one doesn't have to uh, one doesn't have to view it as a, as a hover. But it is a widely uh, accepted practice. Thank you, Harav. Um, we is, do we have Gidon? I don't think we have Gidon, Gidon here. So when you move on to the next question, which is from Chaim in Buchin, um, what is the Rav's opinion on the, Zil the Zilberman method of study for children? And should one's teaching be different if one has girls instead of boys? I once spoke to uh, Rav Zilberman Zetzal about the school that he that he founded and why he, that he did so. And he said to me in his own words that I didn't invent anything. It's not, it's not a shitat zilberman. I didn't come up with this method. This is what the, uh, the Chazal discussed. This is what the Jewish people have always done. It's only in more recent times that uh, various aspects of traditional Jewish Torah education have been somehow modified or overlooked clearly stated ideas of Chaz by Chazal, by Rishonim as to how children should study, uh, were simply ignored and different, different ideas and, and systems were put in place. So Rav, Rav Zilbam and Shita is, is similar to what uh, all Jewish communities used to do, which is they used to start teaching their children certainly in the earlier generations was mainly boys uh, to read from, from the age of six usually, roughly. Um, reading, by the way, includes reading the letters with the vowels, the isorim and the tenuoth together. And then the next stage is learning how to read the pesukim with the ta'amim. In other words, ta'amim mikra is part of learning to read. The fact that this is only true nowadays, essentially, in, in, in a small number of Temani Tamude Torah, is a very unfortunate reality, but that is how it always was, and that, that is how it should be. And once the child is able to do that, then they should study Tanakh. The idea of studying Tanakh is to cover a lot of ground and constantly revise and, and go over what has been learned before so as not to forget all this is is common sense and this is all uh, the traditional way of, of teaching and educating children having covered the Tanakh as it says in Masech uh, if it says first of all in, in, in the in addition to the Mishnah of Masech Adavot Ben Hamesh Mikra Ben Esela Mishnah Ben Hamesh Esela Talmud that's not the original Mishnah, but it's an addition to the Mishnah, but I thought it was added to the Mishnah. And this also appears in the Sahed Sofarim. Uh, it seems that the system was to first cover the entire Tanakh at a young age, and then from the age of 10 approximately to start studying Mishnah without Talmud at that point. And the age of 15 to begin studying Talmud. And that I think is a much healthier and, and, and more correct system and I don't think why anyone should believe that they can reinvent the wheel better than Chazal uh, invented the wheel. And the way that the Jewish communities around the world have been practicing and teaching their children from time immemorial. And the results of other approaches, unfortunately, uh, have not proved themselves at all. Without, without, uh, without, uh, embarking on a, on a long dissertation on the subject, we see that the, the approaches and the methodologies that are common today in most Torah institutions are, are not successful and uh, they, need to be, they need to be revised, they need to be changed. And uh, Rav Zilberman was someone who saw these facts and recognized them for what they were and uh, tried to do something about it. And uh, this merit will be his uh, for all time. 
And there are many other schools that have followed suit. And the way that they teach differs perhaps in different ways from one school to the next, but the general system, the general approach is, is correct. Thank you, Harold. I cannot go into great much more detail. The only, other, uh, the only thing that I need to mention here, the question was asked here about girls instead of boys. Uh, girls should also be taught uh, Tanakh, and they should also, with particular uh, stress on, on um, a less technical and less uh, halakhically difficult, shall we say, parts of the Tanakh, uh, and more stress placed on parts of the Tanakh which are which deal more with, with midoth, with sni'oth, with proper behavior, with derech eretz, things like sefer mishle, and uh, sefer Telim is, is highly recommended and, and should be stressed for all, boys and girls. Thank you, Arav. Um, firstly, I, I stand corrected. It's actually Chaim from Kame Sur now, not Chaim from Brooklyn. Oh. Mazel, tov, mazel tov on your move. Um, the next question is uh, anonymous. Uh, in our current state as a people, at least living in Israel, can the Rav touch on the subjects of schools for children? What are the best types of schools for our children? Should we send children to more Haredi schools or more Dati schools? I have come to the realization over quite a number of years and I've reached the conclusion that if that, if that is the choice between a, a Tilo Umi type school and, and, or, and a more Haredi or Khardali or Haredi Lo Umi type school, I think based on realities and trends that we can we can observe today before our eyes. This perhaps was not the case 40 years ago, but uh, what I'm saying I think is correct and, and uh, relevant to the current reality. I think the Haredi schools are preferable, not because they are so good. Frankly, most of them are far from being very good. And then again, so are the Dati schools. Nevertheless, the Haredi schools tend to be more Torah orientated, more Torah oriented, I should say. And, and uh, there, there is less, I wouldn't say there's none perhaps, but there is less, fewer inroads have been made, shall we say, by, by the uh, general degenerate uh, ideas and opinions and philosophies and dress codes uh, in, in the world around us, few inroads have been made into the Haredi world as things stand today uh, than in the Dati world, unfortunately. The Dati world is in great need of a tremendous shake up and uh, reawakening, which apparently is still going to take some time. Again, Haredi schools are far from perfect, but whatever school one sends one's children to, one has to make up for that which is lacking or that which is not quite right and that which is skewed in the school to which they go, one has to make up for that at home. So first of all, there's always, there is always the possibility that for some people, it's not a, not a simple matter, I know, but there is the possibility of homeschooling. Some people are successful at it and others less so. This is a great challenge, but the results can be, can be, uh, amazingly successful and positive. Where, one this, where, where this is not the case, one has to objectively judge what is missing and what is wrong, what is not quite right in the school to which the children are going, and make up for that at home. And that's, that's something that the parents really have to uh, go out of their way to to be fully aware of what's going on in the school, what kind of what, what kinds of ideas, philosophies, and, and atmosphere exists in the school, and where relevant, where appropriate, things that are wrong have to be countered. They have to, there has to be a, some kind of counterpoint. And, 
different message has to be heard in order to to straighten that out, straighten out that which is not quite right. Thank you, Harav. Um, we uh, well, firstly, uh, uh, in fact, that was an anonymous question, so there's no one to to have any follow up questions. But we, we've reached the um, the, the hour mark. Uh, does Harav have time to to work through some more of these questions? Yes, let's continue. Thank you, thank you. Um, question from Chaim Ginsberg: uh, Is it possible? Is it permissible to set an alarm clock before Shabbat? to ring on Shava. Yes, it is possible. It is more time to do so. Thank you. Um, Yosef from Yavne has a question. Uh, is it necessary to cover the eyes with one's hand when, when, when reciting Shema? And can one simply close, the, can simply closing the eyes suffice? Clearly there is no halakhic requirement to cover one's eyes with, with, that, with, a, with one's hand. The, only, the, the idea here is simply to avoid distraction from those things that are going on around the person, from those things that one sees in front of them. And, and therefore, closing the eyes is, is just as appropriate as covering the, the eyes with one's hand. It's a practice, which is a very common one, but it's certainly not a hobby by any means to, use, to cover one's hands with the, one's eyes with one's hands. Closing the eyes is perfectly sufficient if a person chooses also to to concentrate on on the uh, the text before him let's say he's reading you know shema from uh, homash or from a sibur and he's looking at the words and not allowing himself to be distracted that's also possible there's no requirement to close one's eyes either okay thank you um uh next question is from is for me uh what is the status of the Ole Misraim and Arava regions in Hilchot Shemitah. In short, uh, we can be Mekel uh, with regards to these areas, what, what those areas known as Ole Misraim and uh, the Arava, particularly the southern Arava. But essentially, all of, all of the Arava, we have, uh, there's good basis to claim that uh, Shemitah, for example, or Tanamotha Masra do not apply there. What about Kadushat Shvith with uh, produce from the Ole Misraim region? We said Hadin. I don't think it's uh, we have to be concerned with with Kadushat Shvith from the area of Israel. But uh, it doesn't. On this point, it does not have to be Mahmir. Basically, as as part of the general ed educational process, which we all need to to go through to become more familiar and more uh, used to the, the, the concepts of, of Shemitah, Kudushat, Shemitah, etc. Thank you. Um, question now, this is also from me. Um, when saying Halal Bihidus, um, or in the conventional communal way, i.e. not as described by the Rambam, should one repeat the verses that are commonly repeated, such as Odakha Ki Anithani and Baruch Haba, and when saying halal on a day when it is obligatory and not just a minhag, should every individual say the bracha or just, just the hazan? So we have two questions here, basically. The first question is when saying, reciting halal via hiduth or in a Beth Knesset, in a shul, in the, the way that is normally done in most places. Then the, 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 there's no problem to repeat the, the, those pesukim. The, the repetition of those pesukim is a question of minhav. It's entirely mutar. It's not a chova. One can repeat them or not repeat them. Um, with regards to the second, so quite pesukim like or the chaki anithani or baruch haba b'shem Hashem, etc. You can either repeat them or not. It's up to you. If you're in a Thibur that's saying it, repeating it, then why, why not do the, do the same as the Thibur? No, no problem there at all. It's a question of minhav. With regards to reciting Halel on a day when it is shayahid hayav likroyat Halel, a day when it is obligatory for the individual to recite the Halel, shall we say uh, the eight days of Hanukkah, for example, or the eight days of uh, Sukkot, for example, or the first day of Pesach, etc. If if halal is being uh, recited, 
as described by, by the Talmud, as described by the Rambam, then the correct practice is for the Shariah Sibur, the Hazan, to, to re recite the Baracha, and then he begins to recite the Halel in, the, in, the, in that manner, as described in the Masechet Sukkah and by the Rambam, and the Sibur responds, etc. The, the Sibur in that situation does not recite the Baracha. However, where Halal is not being recited in that fashion, but in the more usual standard way that we come across in most Batekinus at most shuls today, then if it's a day when it is a hova, but it's obligatory for the individual also to recite Halal, so even if he's at home, he would have to recite Halal, as opposed to Rosh Chodesh, where there's no hova at all for the individual to recite Halal on Rosh Chodesh, which is, I mean, how you know, I mean, how does Sibur? So on such a day, when it is a hova for the individual, again, let's say the eight days of Hanukkah, then, then, uh, ev then every individual should recite the bracha and recite all of the words, all of the pasukim of, of Halel by, by themselves. Okay, thank you, Arav. Um, we, uh, the next question is, uh, is again from uh, Chaim in, uh, in Kameso. Uh, what is the Rav's opinion on the minhag of refraining from cutting the hair of one's son until he turns three years old. What is the origin of this minhag and should we follow it? The origins of, of this minhag are entirely unclear. Uh, again, it's not mentioned in the tabu, it's not mentioned in the uh, Yonim, Berishonim. Should we follow it? I don't think there's any, any obligation uh, or any cogent reason to feel obliged to follow this minho. On the other hand, there's nothing wrong with this minho unless it becomes impossible to do with a child's hair. <laughs> the reasons of uh, the hair getting tangled and knotted or something with lice or what have you. Um, but I don't think it's something one has to be very concerned about. What I think is nice is to, whenever age, whatever child's age, when one decides to cut their hair, to uh, to make something out of it, uh, not too much of a big deal, but uh, some kind of a little party, uh, and, uh, and in inject some some elements of of Torah into the into the uh, event. At that age, often the child begins to wear a kippah. Also, and you can, for example, you know, by that point, you might be able to teach the child to repeat one or two pesukim, as, as Chazal also mentioned, Torah uh, Siwalana Moshe, Morasha Chilat Yaakov, and Shema Yisrael, etc. Shema Beni Musar Avicha, such pesukim. That's, that's a nice minhag, more important than the, the actual cutting of the hair or the, the age. Thank you. Um, Chaim, did you have any follow-up questions on uh, on that particular issue. No, um, he did, however, just a point I had a, a follow up question on. I do have had time just on the previous question he asked. I actually, I um, apologize, I, I, I didn't ask him at the time um, if he had anything to be clarified. Um, he, he just posted in the chat a couple of questions. Um, uh, so um, on, let me just find it. Um, uh, does the question is does one risk putting his children at odds with the school um, in a Haredi system uh, and the Haredi mentality if uh, if at home teaching uh, the, the, the teachings of Machon Shilo and Torah Terech Israel well very simply I would say that at uh, a very young age three, four, five, six perhaps the child is not not really ready to hear uh, and to know about certain things and doesn't really have to. But as a child gets to the age of seven or eight, seven being generally accepted, Gil uh, an age from which one can begin to train and teach children various things, one can begin to explain in a, in a calm and collected fashion without any, uh, without uh, having to feel obligated to attack anybody, but explain that there are different sakim, there are different halachic opinions and different minharim, and this is what we do at home. 
something along those lines. And there's nothing that that should that should work. That should be okay. And yes, one does have to use common sense when it comes to these things. No question. Common sense is one of the assumptions that the Torah makes that a person has common sense. Even though, as a wise man once said, it is not that common. Indeed. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Rav. As always, we're very grateful to Rav for. Um, answering our questions. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions and who participated. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.